Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Again, it is so good to be back in the house of the Lord. I tell you, it, it blesses me to come in and see your faces there uh, every Sunday. And if you're visiting with us, we want to welcome you. We, of course, welcome our, our Internet audience this morning. Uh, we're doing a series on the American heritage. Been doing it for this month. Um, we, our theme um, passage of Scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, if you want to look there with me. Verse 12, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place for myself as the house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, if they will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, and do according to all that have, I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I coveted with David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land, and I will give I w that I, which I have given them, and this house, which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all people. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and this house? Then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who brought them up out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this calamity on them. Now, what God said to Solomon in that passage of Scripture is a kingdom principle. It didn't just apply to the children of Israel and to that particular house, which we know lays desolate today. If you remember, Jesus told the disciples, he said, not one stone will remain upon another. He's going to cast it down. And he did that because they forsook the God who had blessed them. And that kingdom principle applies even to this day. And it is so important that the church of Jesus Christ in America and around the world realizes if you turn from God and you forsake him and you worship and serve other gods, what he did to them, he will do to us. And he'll do to us right here in America. Psalms chapter 33 verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. For the, from the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our souls wait for the Lord because he is our help and our shield. Now, in 1776, a group of godly men signed a piece of paper that would change history. But there's a whole lot that has changed since then. Because we've gone from a nation that believed that you could not even call yourself an American if you subverted the word of God. Are you hearing me? You couldn't even call yourself an American if you subverted the Word of God to a nation now whose leaders all but ignore the Word of God. 
Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And for many years, America was exalted, and for good reason, because righteousness was woven through the fabric of our nation, from the church house to the courthouse to the White House. Righteousness was woven into the fabric of everything that we were and everything that we stood for. But when righteousness is first neglected in the church house, the rest of the nation will soon follow. A nation will go the way of its leaders, and the leaders are the reflection of the way the people are going. If the leaders are righteous, it is because they have been placed there by righteous people. Let me say that again. If the leaders are righteous, it's because they've been put there by you and I, righteous people who have been taught righteousness by the righteous spiritual leaders, which we refer to as the clergy. And God has always intended that civil leadership and spiritual leadership works together. I mean, you look, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all the judges, they were all leaders of a civil nation. Their spiritual leader was God. They got their instructions directly from God. But the time came when the people said, we want a king. And so God gave them a king. But the king was a civil leader, not a spiritual leader. But when you look in Scripture, the king was always in connection with the prophet. Because you had the, the first king was King Saul. Samuel was the prophet. And he would go to Samuel and ask for his advice on how to lead the nation. After that, King David, he went to Nathan. He had uh, uh, Samuel as his leader. And then Nathan, the prophet, his son Solomon had even the evil, wicked king Joah, uh, uh, Ahab had Elijah who he would go to to ask for advice. So throughout Scripture, uh, we see that the civil government and the religious government, they work together. And, and can I just say as a side note this morning, if every person in America who professed to be a follower of Jesus Christ would go to the poll and vote, we would determine who runs this country every single election. There's that much power in the church. But sadly, the church doesn't necessarily choose righteousness anymore. A lot of times they vote their pocketbook, or they, most of the time they vote their pocketbook. <laughs> the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, amen? And sadly, they said we're motivated by too many things other than our righteous convictions. But in the beginning, America was led by righteous men who were greatly influenced by righteous leaders. They, were, they wore black robes. So I wore this black robe this morning to honor the men that were the most responsible for our freedom and our independence because the righteousness that exalted this nation was because of their influence. The message this morning, I preached it before, <clears throat> But for the benefit of those who are joining us on the Internet, I, I wanted to preach this message again called the Black Robe Regiment. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, God, we thank you for the men who, who, who's gone before us, Lord. And, God, they set examples for us to follow, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we, we see the, the history of what they did and what they accomplished, God. And it, it should be a challenge, Lord. It sets the bar for us, God. And, Lord, as we examine that and we look this morning at the, the marvelous things that they did, Father, may it be a challenge to us, God, uh, to, Lord, reach that goal again. And, Father, just as we have dedicated this child this morning, Lord, and we, we committed ourselves to be an example for him to follow, Lord, may we as followers of Jesus Christ commit ourselves to be an example for the world to follow. That, God, when we're in the marketplace, Lord, or when we're in our homes, Father, even when we are all alone by ourselves, Lord, may we live a life, God, that we would not have to stand before the throne and apologize. For, Lord, we know that it's appointed unto every man to die, and after the death of judgment, Lord, when we stand before your throne, God, may we be able to stand there, Lord, not being ashamed of the life that we've lived, Lord. God, make us righteous people. Give us a hunger, God, for righteousness this morning, Lord. As we examine our history, Lord, and God, we try to uh, correct anything that might be wrong in our life, Lord, that we live a life that's acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, the Black Robe Regiment was actually a name that was given to the clergy by the British. They called them the Black Robe Regiment because the British blamed the clergy for the battle of the war for independence uh, of, of America. Now, you say, well, why would they do that? Because it was actually the clergy that conceived and birthed the idea of a free and independent nation. These men not only conceived and birthed the idea, but they took actions to ensure its reality because they motivated the civil leaders to do the same thing. There was a man named by the name John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. He actually, there is a statue of him uh, uh, at the U.S. Capitol. He was a pastor of a Lutheran church in Woodstock, Virginia. In mid-January of 1776, he is in his pulpit wearing his black robe. He opened the Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. And he says, to everything there is a season. There is a time to every purpose under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to loose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Then he said, quote, in the language of the Holy Writ, there is a time for all things, a time to pray and a time to preach. But a new time has come. There is a time to fight, and that time is now. If we fail to stand up against the oppressor, if we don't rise up to protect ourselves and our precious liberties, we will lose them to the tyrant. For none else will take up this cause for us. We must make the sacrifice. We must bear up in arms in the fight. So I call you now to stand with me in this cause most urgent and noble. He had a boy come up and start playing a drum. He unzipped his black robe, and he was wearing a Continental Army uniform underneath. And at the beat of the drum, he rallied 300 men to join him to make up what was, would become the 8th Virginia Regiment. He became a major general, a pastor, become a major general in the Continental Army. His brother, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, didn't believe in what he was doing until the British burned down his church. There's a statue of him in the speaker's lobby because he was the original speaker of the house, a clergyman. His signature is one of only two on the Bill of Rights, John Adams, civil government, and Frederick Muhlenberg, religious government or spiritual government. See, that was God's intention from the beginning. The civil government and religious government works together because civil government doesn't know what God has to say. He goes to the man of God to say, what is the Lord telling us? Which direction would, would, would God have us to go? These were men on the forefront proclaiming liberty, resisting tyranny, opposing any encroachment on God-given rights and freedom. In 1898, a Methodist bishop and church historian Charles Galloway wrote, referring to the Black Robe Regiment, quote, mighty men they were of iron nerve and strong hand, of unblanched cheek and hearts of flame. God needed not a reed shaken by the wind, nor men clothed in soft raiment, but heroes of hardihood and lofty courage. And such were the sons of the mighty who responded to the divine call. Because they believed that this was the divine call of God to fight for the independence of America. The wording of the Declaration of Independence and all the rights listed there were nothing more than the sermon topics that had been preached for two decades leading up to the Revolutionary War. That was not necessarily unique, though, because the ministries that had shaped our nation for a century and a half had been the clergy going all the way back to the Puritans, 
For example, when the government was formed right here in the state we live in, in Virginia, the legislature met in the Jamestown Church. They opened up in prayer by Reverend Mr. Burke, and the elected legislators then sat in the church choir loft to conduct legislative business. So you see, the very first movement towards democracy in America was inaugurated in the house of God. See, this is a lot of history that you never get in the public education system. People don't know our history. They don't know the religious Christian roots of the American heritage. In 1620 Massachusetts, the established government was their pastor, Rob, uh, John Robinson. In 1636, the Reverend Roger Williams established the state of Rhode Island. So that's two states established by clergy. The same year, in 1636, the Reverend Thomas Hooker, along with the Reverend Samuel Stone, John Davenport, and Theophilus Eaton founded the state of Connecticut. George Whitfield, who was the pastor who brought in, who preached what we call the Great Awakening from 1714 to 1770, he accompanied uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin in England when they went there to protest the Stamp Act and to fight for our independence. Civil government, religious government, going to England to speak up on behalf of America. Whitfield urged America to separate from the British, he said, quote, now I want you to get this, the British will take away civil and religious freedoms if we do not separate. Now that's important right there. Because as I'm looking over American history and I look at the scripture, listen, no matter what our history may be, it does not supersede the word of God. Nothing supersedes the word of God. And it's a little bit, it was a little bit concerning to me because in Romans chapter 13, it tells us to obey civil authority. And if you, because it's given by God. And if you resist civil authority, you're resisting God. And if you resist that, he will judge you for that. But we rose up against our sovereign, against Great Britain. What justification did we have for that? Because according to scripture, you can't do that. There was no proviso for that. Tells you in, 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 in Psalms the same thing, that we're to submit to those that's in authority over us. So what right did we have? And the right is in this. Scripture does not teach that Christians must always obey the government authorities no matter what. Because when man's law is in direct conflict to the revealed word of God, then I'm not obliged to comply to that. We see examples of that. Practicing civil disobedience includes Simon, Peter, and John because they were told by the Sanhedrin, do not preach in this name anymore. They beat them and they sent him out and they said they found him the next day in the synagogue preaching. They brought them back and said, didn't we strictly forbid you to do that? And they said, well, whether it's right to obey you or to obey God, you judge. Because church... We are to obey God. And in this country, when I preached this last week, when they tell you you can't speak up, I am commanded by Jesus Christ to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. That is a command directly from Jesus Christ. And any government, I don't care who they are, that tells you you can't mention the name of Jesus, because remember there was a, gov a judge that told a little teenage girl if she prayed in the name of Jesus at a high school, he would have her arrested. You don't have that right. And even if they did exercise that right, it does not supersede the Word of God. And so if their law is in direct conflict to the law of God, I am not obliged to comply to that. And we should not comply. And that was the case of the American people because England was getting ready to take away their religious freedom to worship the way God commanded them to. And when that's a threat, then you have the right to rebel against that. And so I, I accepted that they had biblical re reasons for doing that. Not just Peter and John, but the Hebrew midwives, when Pharaoh told them that if it's a boy child, you kill it, would disobey that law. They said, we're, we're not killing these little Hebrew babies. And so the Pharaoh comes in, I thought I commanded you to kill them. They said, well, the Hebrew women, they're not like our women. They're like, quick, man, by the time we get there, they've already had the child. 
but they directly defied the orders of their government to do what was right because they said they feared God. They would rather obey God than obey their government. We see the same thing with Daniel. When they told him you had to worship the image of the king, he wouldn't do that. They told him he couldn't pray. He prayed anyway, and they brought him in and threw him in a lion's den. And the king loved Daniel. And he comes out that morning and said, Daniel, are you still alive? He said, I'm still here. The lions, are, God has closed them. He said, there was an angel with me and closed the mouth of the lion. Same thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When you hear this sound of the instruments playing, you bow down and worship the image of the king. We were not bound to anybody but God. So they heated up the fire and furnace seven times hotter. Said the men that threw them in there and killed them. And said they looked and said, O king said, we threw three men in the fire, but we see four clothed, dancing, walking around, and one looks like the son of God. Said he came out in their clothes, didn't even smell like smoke. Amen. Come on, man. God has got some fireproof. Yeah. It's better to obey God than man. Can somebody say amen? Amen. But the Black Road Regiment was so deeply involved in civil government uh, they were as involved in that as they were in religious government. And it's, it should be that way. I mean, Saul had Samuel, David had Nathan, Solomon had Nathan, Abraham even had Elijah. Because God has ordained that spiritual leadership are to work side by side with, with civil leadership. But today we hear those words, separation of church and state. <laughs> Can I just tell you something? There has never been a bigger, they talk about the big lie. That's the big lie. Because the Danbury Baptists was afraid that when they formed an American government, that the American government would do the same thing that the British government had done. To tell them how you're going to worship, because they had a state church. And the state church had to preach the way the state told them to. Come on, there's states right here in America that's attempted to do that told the pastors they had to turn in their sermon notes. I think they're doing that in Canada now. Got to turn in your sermon notes. Let's see what you're going to preach about before we can let you preach that. Excuse me, but I'm not turning my sermon notes into, I'm, you're getting it fresh right off the press. You're the first ones to hear it. Amen. And besides that, half the time I'm not even on my notes. I'm, I'm going by something the Lord just dropped in my spirit. So how can I give the government a copy of that? But when they, Danbury Baptist was concerned that the government would restrict them, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist that says, we're not going to interfere that because we believe in the separation of church and state, meaning that the state's not going to be involved in the affairs of the church. He never meant that the church is not going to be involved in the affairs of the state, and we know that because the Congress, the first time they meet, they opened in prayer. And they asked the clergyman to pray. Not only that, but they set up the Capitol to have church services in the Capitol. No, you don't hear that in in public history. Not only that, but the Congress voted and made it a law that you hire clergy and paid by your tax dollars. Our government passed that. Not only that, but they wanted chaplains for the military and every branch, and they are paid for by the government. So where in heaven's name do they get this lie about the separation of church and state where the church can't be involved in our government? That's never been the intention of of our founding fathers. And it hasn't been the intention of the Congress since then. It's been fought over and over again, but thank God we still have chaplains in the military. I have met the chaplain in the Congress, Brother Black. He's from South Carolina. When I heard him preach, I thought, man, this is going to be a dry as last week's toast because he's taught real proper. And I thought, oh, boy, this is going to be fun. But let me tell you something, brother. Have you ever heard the song by Neil Diamond about the, the Salvation Show? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, all you heathens out there, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Grab the old ladies and pack up the babies cause everyone knows, everyone goes to Brother Lush shows. Hallelujah. And he says he starts real low and says when he lets go, the whole valley shakes. 
Huh? Can we let go? The whole valley shakes. Well, that was Brother Black, brother, because he started off dry, but when he let go, he's a man of God, chaplain to our Congress. They have Bible studies. No, we don't hear that on the news. Where congressmen are coming together and studying the Word of God to this day, praying. They're there. I don't know if they're on both sides of the aisle, but I know one side of the aisle that's there. You figure that out. God has ordained the spiritual leaders and civil leaders work side by side. That was intention from the very beginning. But the separation of church and state has become the cry of the anti-God movement. The theme is let civil authority run the government and let religious authority run the church and may the two never meet. I actually sat in a conference where a major denominational spiritual leader said that pastors need to stop talking about politics from the pulpit. And I could not contain myself. I said very loudly, I couldn't disagree with that any, any stronger. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Sit down and shut up. No, I am commanded to preach the gospel. And that means in the church house, in the courthouse, in the White House, in any house. He said to every creature, there's creatures all over the place, amen? There would be no civil government without religion. The Black Road Regiment motivated the civil leadership. If it hadn't been for the clergy, that we would not have our independence today. Do you understand that? It was the clergy that motivated those in civil authority to take up arms and fight for our independence and our religious freedoms. Getting ahead of myself here. Here we go. I don't want to miss that. Not only did they frame the Constitution and encourage independence, they fought for it. Clergymen didn't just stop at words. They led armies. I told you about uh, John Peter uh, Muhlenberg. He would preach on Sunday, then he would fight every day of the week. Come back to his pulpit and preach on Sunday. He would take his rifle Monday morning, and he'd go back to the battlefield. Paul Revere, when he was riding on the famous ride of Paul Revere, come on, you cheerleaders remember that, don't you? Listen, my children, and you will hear of the famous ride of Paul Revere as he rode, as he rode, as he rode all night saying, come on, come on, let's fight, fight, fight. Yeah. Come on, I even remember that cheer. Y'all didn't have that cheer in high school. Well, Paul Revere, when he was riding to Lexington, he wasn't just riding through the countryside saying, the British are coming, the British are coming. He said that but he was on his way to a destination. He was on his way to the house of Reverend Jonas Clark. You say, well, why was he headed to the preacher's house? Because that's where Samuel Adams was at and John Hancock. Samuel Adams and John Hancock went to the home of Reverend Clark often, and he knew that's where the government, that's where the leading government was. Samuel Adams was there. John Hancock was there. So he's headed to the pastor's house. And when he got there, he said, the British, they're coming, guys. Samuel Adams looked at Jonas Clark and said, are the men ready? And he said, quote, I have prepared them for such a time as this. What men is he talking about? He's talking about the men sitting in his church. Are they ready? He said, I have prepared them for just such a time as this. They went out on the lawn of the church in Lexington, 150 men with Reverend Jonas Clark standing there. And he said, quote, God blesses a defensive war, not an offensive war. Do not fire unless you're fired upon. Question, who fired the first shot? We know who fired it. We didn't declare war against Great Britain. They declared war against us. And we simply defended ourselves. Because we tried on two different occasions to have a resolution with them and, and have reconciliation. 
And when we gave them that peaceful plea, they met it with armed military force. There were several violations of British common law and English Bill of Rights. In 1770, the British fired on an unarmed group of civilians in the Boston Massacre. So they, we didn't, we wanted a peaceful solution, but they tried to force us militarily and with shooting people, and we simply defended ourselves. In Lexington, eight church members laid there on this church lawn dead. Another part of history you may not know is when Paul Revere was making his famous ride, there was another guy named Wentworth Cashwell. He was a black man. And he rode to the north doing the same thing because they didn't know where exactly the British were headed. And he's riding to the north. And so he's letting all of the, the pastors know, look, the British, they're coming, they're coming. The thing we've been fearing that would happen is happening right now. And the, and the pastors went and got their congregations together and met the British. Thousands of church members now met the British on their way back from Lexington. Pastors became officers and answered the British attack. Reverend Phillips Payson, Reverend Benjamin Belt, pastors from other areas also responded. In Vermont, the Reverend David Aries. Uh, promptly gathered 20 men and marched towards Boston. The Reverend Stephen Farrer in New Hampshire led 97 of his parishioners to Boston. At Bunker Hill, the Reverend Grosvenor heard that the battle had commenced, and he left his pulpit with his rifle in his hand. Now, I want you to get this picture. He's in church with his rifle somewhere leaning against the wall. How, couldn't you just look around this morning and see him? I better be careful with that. I'm not advocating no. arm resistance. Don't get me wrong and don't say I said that. I'm not. But I, you got to get the picture of what it looked like back then. They had their rivals sitting against the wall because they never knew. And the, the British has already shot a bunch of unarmed, innocent civilians. Yeah. It's peacefully gathered. So there's they, like we never know when our government's just going to come and start shooting you. And wouldn't that be horrible in America? Yes. God, the, the day never comes, you know. Jesus. Reverend Jonathan French, Reverend Thomas Reed in Philadelphia, Reverend John Steele, other clergymen officers, Isaac Lewis in Newark, Connecticut, Joseph Willard raised two full companies, James Latay, William Graham, John Craig Hill. It is said that he fought and preached alternately. So he, he was on the battlefield, he'd fight for a little while and stop and preach for a little while. Reverend Dr. Cooper, Reverend John Blair Smith, president of Hampton Sydney College, was a captain of a company. The Reverend James Hall commanded a company that armed against Cornwallis. Reverend Naftali Daggart, the president of Yale, single-handedly resisted the British. Reverend James Caldwell in New Jersey was a British. The British burned his church, murdered his family. In one battle outside of his church now, they're, they're at church and the British attacked them. And so they're out there. They ran out of wadding. And so they've got powder. They got shot, but they didn't have any wadding. I don't know if you know anything about, about black powder rifle, but you pour your powder in. Then you have to put a piece of paper in there before you put the shot in. Well, they ran out of that little piece of paper. So he goes back in, grabs the hymn books that was written by Watts. Watts was the man who made, wrote the hymn book. And he come running out there and was ripping the pages out of the hymn book and said, give them Watts, boys. There's a painting of him in the Capitol entitled, give them Watts. And so they tore the hymn book out and shoved it down there and shooting the British with him. They, get, they shot him with the word of the living God. Uh, James Coswell, the same man, he would lay a big pulpit Bible. Every Sunday he'd come in, he'd plop his Bible down, open it up, and lay two brace pistols on each side of it and defy any man to take either. The Reverend John Wise, as early as 1687, he was preaching already that taxation without representation was tyranny. He was a huge man. He is known for his ability to wrestle. 
And so he was getting older. A, a young ship captain named John Chandler had heard about what a good wrestler he was, and he came and challenged him, the pastor, to a wrestling match. And he said, son, I'm getting old. He said, but all right. So he jumps on Reverend Wise, who then picks him up and throws him across the fence. John gets up and he shakes himself off. He said, well, I have been soundly defeated, and I will take my leave as soon as you throw my horse across the fence to me. <laughs> One Sunday he's preaching, and a word came to him that pirates had uh, kidnapped some of the members of his church. So he prayed that they would rise up and butcher their enemy. <laughs> Ministers were often themselves targeted by the British because they felt like if you kill the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. Not only did they fight, they ratified the Constitution. When the Constitution was complete and submitted to the states for ratification, there were nearly four dozen clergymen were elected as ratifying delegates. So they wanted men of God to say, is this, is this in line with God's will? And so the clergy ratified our Constitution. Not only that, but our educational system. The Black Rose started the educational system. They believed that only a liter literate people well-versed in the teaching of the Bible could sustain a free and enlightened government. In 1635, the Puritans established America's first public school. 1647, they passed the America's first public education law called the Old Deluder Satan's Act. Now, why would they call it something like that? We're starting a school. We're going to call it the Old Deluder Satan's Act. In other words, we want to teach our children how to live a life so that Satan can't defeat you and destroy you. And to do that, they use the Word of God to teach in public education. Harvard University was started by a Puritan minister, John Harvard. Yale was founded by 10 congreg con uh, congregational ministers. Princeton was uh, established by Presbyterian ministers, Jonathan Dickinson, John Pearson, and El Ebenezer Pemberton. William and Mary College was established by Episcopal ministers, Jane Blair. Dartmouth College was established by Congregational Minister Eleazar Wheelock. This continued for the next two and a half centuries. By 1860, 91% of all college presidents were ministers of the gospel. They don't teach that in public education. Nine, over nine out of ten people that were presidents of the college were clergymen as were more than one-third of all university faculty members. Just imagine today if the university had over one-third of every university had pastors as their faculty members. And I'm not talking about liberal leaning. I'm talking about men of God that believed in the power of God and the Word of God teaching in our universities once again. Of the 246 colleges founded by the close of 1860, only 17 were not affiliated with some religious denomination. By 1884, 83% of America's 370 colleges still remained denominational churches. Noah Webster, who was called the schoolmaster of America, said to them, speaking of the clergy, to them, it is, more, it is popular education in this country more indebted than any other class of men. Today, God had his, and his word is not welcome in school, though. In 1962, they kicked God out of the school. Can't read the Bible, can't pray in school anymore. Church, I remember going to school and over the intercom, a student reading a passage of Scripture and praying over the intercom. Anybody remember that in school? I remember that. I remember the Gideons coming. I still got my little New Testament that the Gideons gave me in school. The Gideons came and handed out Bibles in the school. That ended in 1962. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember that. <laughs> By 1884, let's see, I've read that. But it's, church, it's time for us to stand up again. 
Because in short, America's independence, her freedom, her government, her educational system, and many other positive aspects of American life and culture is the product of the black robe regiment, the black robes, the clergy. Civil leaders were righteous because people demanded it. People demanded it because the clergy had taught it. And a, and a head of a denominational, national denominational leader says, we need to stop talking about politics in church. I'm like, sir, go read your history, please. The landscape looks very different today. The influence of clergy has waned because people are more interested in win winning popularity votes than standing for righteousness. Church, I love you guys. I do with all my heart. I, I do, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way. I don't. But I play for an audience of one. You know, I hope you agree with me. But I'm going to stand for righteousness in the Word of God if nobody agrees with me. And I'm not doing it like in your face. I'm doing it because I love you. And I know this is the way. Walk you in it, you know. And, and there, there was a time when men believed that and they preached that. And people heard that and they knew that it was true and it was right and it was good. And they demanded the same thing that the clergy demanded. And that's why we had godly men in government and our nation has been so blessed. Yeah. It's time for the American clergy to reclaim the important position of influence. Because yeah. it just calls me when we are so... We, we've got to be seeker sensitive. I, I remember when that term came out, and I'm, I'm at a conference, and they're like, you've got to be seeker sensitive. People are seeking something. You've got to be sensitive to them. I'm like, how about being sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Because sometimes the Word of God, we, we, we had a long time ago, somebody said, the truth will set you free, but first it will tick you off. Uh, come on. I, I remember a guy, he's a faithful follower of Christ today. He's a very dear friend of mine. He came to my Sunday school class long before I became a pastor. And he said, I would leave there Sunday morning. I'd be so mad. He said, I'm, not, I'm never going back down. He was mad at me. I'm preaching out of the book of James. You know, it's talking about a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you believe for something, believe. If you, because a man that doesn't believe, he can't, that, that man's not going to receive anything. And I'm just teaching like that. I'm just teaching the Bible. And he was so mad at me. He said, I'm never going back down there again. And he would get home, and the Holy Spirit would start working on him. He's like, <laughs> And the truth set him free. He's a great man of God today. Because he let the Word of God soak in, and instead of getting offended by it, he grew by it. So men need to quit, get over the popularity contest thing, and, and politically correct, and seeker sensitive, start getting sensitive to the Holy Spirit once again. And preach the uncompromised Word of God. Reverend Charles Stanley, a leading in the, leader in the Second Great Awakening, said, quote, brethren... Our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. If immorality prevails in the land, the fault is ours to a great degree. Talking about the clergy. If there is a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, the pulpit is responsible for it. I think that would apply today when we see the mainstream media. Come on. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundation of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. Let's not ignore this fact, my dear brethren. But let us lay it to heart and be thoroughly awake to our responsibility to respect to moral, the morals of this nation. Charles Finney was appealing to the clergy, saying, guys, you need to preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all authority. Amen. America once again needs the type of courageous ministers described by Bishop Galloway. He said, quote, 
Mighty men they were of iron nerve and strong hand, unblanched cheek and hearts of flame. God needed a reed shaken not by the wind, not men clothed in soft raiment, but heroes of hardihood and lofty courage. And such were the sons of the mighty who responded to the divine call. It's time to reinvigorate the Black Rose Regiment. I appeal to pastors around the world that hears this message. I hope they hear it. Repent if they're preaching liberal, left-wing, cancel culture garbage. The battle for religious freedom is, a, is as real today as it was in the time of our nation's founding. It's not being threatened by a tyrant 3,000 miles away, but by our own national leaders. Yes. In the beginning, America allowed for the civil and spiritual leadership to work together. But that changed gradually over time. In 1954, a U.S. congressman by the name of Lyndon B. Johnson was a senator passed the Johnson Amendment, which said that if you're a 50C3 tax-exempt status, a charity, you can't take a politi political position. And when he made that ruling, the church went silent. Now, in the history of America, I have never known a church to lose its tax-exempt status. But they were threatened by the government. If you, if you, if you, uh, promote a politician or do you take a stand on one political party or the other, we will take your tax exempt status away from you. And so the pastors cowered down and they wouldn't say anything. Yeah. I was not in that group, by the way. Yeah. I'm like, take, take your money. For my God is not, his arm is not short and he will supply your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. Come on, he owns them dar hills. He owns the taters in them dar heels. Yes. Amen? So keep your money. Yes. We're going to stand for what's right and what's righteous yes. because God commanded us to. Yes. So take your money. But pastors sold out. And, and you can get angry at this, but it's just history. I was so pleased just a few years ago when the president, John J. Trump, re abolished the Johnson Amendment and once again returned the right of the pastors to not be afraid to stand up and endorse a politician if they chose to. And if they wanted to endorse some demonic politician, that's their right. I mean, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to endorse some man of God. I mean, he better be a follower of Jesus Christ or he don't get my vote. Or at least profess to be one. So we reversed that. I also watched in amazement and with great pleasure as pastors once again went into the Oval Office to counsel the national leader and lay hands on him and pray for him. Church, I hadn't seen that in my lifetime. I've been around for quite a few presidents now, and I've never seen that in my lifetime until they went into the Oval Office and prayed for Donald J. Trump. Now, you can think what you want to, but as a Christian, that brought me great pleasure. And you can think about the man. You might think he is a jerk, and I don't care what you think about him. You can't deny the fact that he opened the Oval Office and said, Pastors, I want you to come in and pray for me. He called him up. I, I need your counsel. Whether he took it or not, I don't know. But at least he was open to hear what they had to say. Yeah. Now, why did that happen? I believe that it happened because of what happened several years ago in D.C., a, a thing called the call. The call. We went to that. And the call was when people came together to repent for this nation. And that was the sole purpose of it. We are here to repent as a nation and say, God, forgive us. Forgive us. And I think as an act of that repentance, God began to move again. Because God told Solomon, if you forsake God, I will forsake you. If you embrace other gods, I'm going to bring calamity against you. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, if they will pray, if they will seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and I will heal their land. I'll forgive their sin. And church, I, we are seeing, I believe, a stirring in the spirit because of that. It's taken a while, but I think it, America needs to continue to be in a state of repentance. God, we've turned our back on you. We have. 
And church, we need to stand up as individuals. Revival doesn't begin in the church. It begins right here. And we need to individually have a revival. Because I pray, God, when I went back to put this robe on, I'm back here like this. I'm like, God, I don't want to just get up and perform today. God, I want you to work in my heart. I want to be the man after your own heart. God, make it real. God, I want to be as real when I'm all by myself as I am in front of these people today. God, fill me with your spirit today. That's where revival begins, church. When you sell out 100% and you sell out and everybody sells out 100% and the church across America sells out for Jesus Christ again, we will see the hand of God on this nation again. And I believe we're beginning to see that. Supreme Court just this week, six to three, reversed the murdering of millions of children in this nation. A battle we have fought for decades. God, that, church, there's, there's something spiritual stirring to make something like that happen. Men that are brave enough, their lives are being threatened now. They're having to be escorted home because people are threatening their lives. Church, there there are people on both sides of this argument, and if people are burning down abortion clinics, stop it. That's not the way we respond. That's the way the other side responds. And, and I don't know that Antifa wouldn't go burn one down just to say the Christians did it. You know, because one of their tactics is to do something and then blame it on the other side. You're Absolutely right. The battle is not won, though. It is still raging because now it goes to the states. And right now, Virginia is a very liberal state when it comes to the subject of abortion. The past governor that we just had said it's all right. After, after a child is born, we will keep it comfortable until the parents decide what they want to do. In other words, we'll let the thing die right there. A little baby, we will let it. It's born alive. We'll let it die if that's what mommy wants. Because my body, my choice. Let me tell you something. There's other people involved here, mommy, than just you. Because there's a child that has a living being that doesn't get a choice. And that's what we've been fighting for for decades. Who chooses for that person? Not only that, but there's a man in this picture somewhere. I don't know if you know about biology, but it takes two to tango. Amen. And daddy might want that child to be born, but what choice does he have? It's not just your body, your choice. Somebody needs to choose for that child. Somebody needs to choose for dad that might like to have a a son or a daughter be born alive. And so those laws need to be changed on the state level as well. So the battle is not over. Everything that is promoted by the progressive liberal movement is in stark contrast to God's word. And the form of government that has risen to power is just like Great Britain and King George. They are a supreme force to the Christian religion in America. Just look at the media today. The media almost entirely is against everything that the church is for. You know, and I'm listen, church, I'm not against any one. I'm not against people, any person. Jesus came, the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish. Because he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So I, it doesn't matter what you are. You can be an adulterer, a liar, a thief, a murderer, And then we go there, yeah, you can be a lesbian, you can be a gay person, you can be bisexual. Whatever alphabet you want to tag onto that, Jesus died for you. And and can I just say something? We sort of put categories in it, like the LGBT, and like, oh, they're horrible. Church, before you met Jesus, 
You stunk just as much in the sight of God as they do. Sin is sin. And sin separates you from God. It doesn't matter what it is. So we're not putting him in a category like, ooh, horrible. We were all horrible. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So understand, I love you. You may not have been all of that, and I love you, and I'm for you. They may be all of that, and I love them, and I'm for them. But church, I wasn't for what you did before you came to Christ. And I'm not for what they do. They say, well, you hate. I don't hate anybody. I love them all. But I am opposed to what they do. The media is in favor of what they do. They promote it. They encourage it. Pro-abortion. They were for that. I oppose abortion. I'm not against the woman that takes that choice. In fact, my heart breaks for her. Because I know that at some point, and some of you ladies sitting here, you know because you are that person. And I preached on that one time, and I said, ladies, you need to know this. Your baby is with Jesus. And your baby has forgiven you. You need to understand that. And you need to forgive yourself. All right? So we don't want to heap condemnation. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. And then... So I have to make that point because when, when we say that the media is, they're against, they're for what we're against. I'm not against the people. I'm against what they do. The anti-Christian, anti-God, the Antifa, all those things. They support every form of immorality. <clears throat> they oppose the Constitution. The media is anti-capitalism. They're pro-socialism. <clears throat> So church, it's not enough just to ask God to defend and restore the freedom we have enjoyed. Because the only hope for America, I believe, is the Black Robe Regiment to raise a standard once again. And its citizens to humble themselves, to pray, to seek God's face, to turn from their wicked ways. Then and only then will God heal this nation. And church... <clears throat> We shouldn't complain about America if our life is compromised as those in Solomon's day who went seeking other gods. Because if you're seeking other gods, whether it's money, possessions, yourself, a lot of times we make ourselves a god unto ourselves. You understand? And if you're doing that, God said, I w because you forsake me, I'm going to bring calamity on you. So if America's under the judgment of God, and we're complaining about it, and living a compromising life, you've got no room to complain. We need to live our lives wholly separated unto the Lord. And if this person does it, and that person does it, and that person does it, pretty soon, listen, you know how you, you, know how you fill up a bucket? One drop at a time. And if we start with myself and the next guy, the next guy, the next guy, pretty soon the church is full. The church in America is full of people sold out to Jesus again. <clears throat> the only way for a nation to repent is if the church leads once again to repent itself and lives a God-centered life. Yes. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Thank God for the Black Robe Regiment this morning. Well, gave you another history lesson. Hope it's ministered to you. Why don't you stand with me, if you would, please? <clears throat> Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. The next Sunday, we're going to wrap up our um, American Heritage Series. We're going to also have a freedom party. Going to ask you to bring your lawn chairs with you, dress in blue jeans. Jeannie's like, everybody dress in red, white, and blue. I'm like, I don't even know if I have red, white, and blue clothes or not. I'll figure out something. I might be wearing a red bandana or something next Sunday. I may look a little strange. I know more strange than I do now, but. Uh, also, men, I know, so John, you like to cook, brother. They're having an apple pie cooking contest next Sunday. Because, I mean, that's American. Uh, baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and somebody say Ford? <laughs> no. Do y'all don't know what the American, baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. Chevrolet. Uh, did somebody say that? My grandson told me he wanted a Ford. I'm like, you're a Newcomb boy. 
mean you want a Ford? This is what he told me. I said, why do you want a Ford? He said, well, because I like the way they look. They're made in America. They're built Ford tough, and I know how to spell it. I'm going to give him a spelling lesson. How to spell it. I don't know if I can spell Chevrolet myself. <laughs> Any word that ends with a T and you don't hear it, I don't know about that. They sure do run good, though. Nah, I'm just going around. So we're looking forward to that, and we're, gonna, we're just going to celebrate our freedom. I'm glad to be an American. How about you? Yeah. I really am. Yeah. And so um, I've been enjoying preaching this. I hope you've enjoyed being here and going through it. God, help us, Lord, today. Help us, God. When I say us, God, a nation, a church, Lord, a people. God, I pray for those that's not a part of the church, Lord. I pray for American people, Lord. God, just help us, Lord. And Lord, I, I know that you, you want to help more than we even want you to. But, Lord, you told us to intercede, to pray. We have not, for we ask not. Or we ask amiss that we may heap it upon our own lust. Lord, we ask because, Lord, we want to see you back in the, the, the dealings of America again, Lord. America has been a great blessing to people all around the world, Lord. We have been the very power and force to fight for freedom, Lord, and people's right to live their life in peace, God. And so, Lord, make America strong, God. Make it mighty. Make it great again, God. And, Lord, you, you know how to do that, God. You know what to do in the White House, Lord, in the Senate, in the Congress, the Supreme Court, everywhere, God. But, Lord, all of that, I think, is a reflection of the church, Lord. And as we look at history, Lord, the church has always been the influence to bring, to bring people into a place of righteousness, to demand that, to demand that their leaders are righteous. So if the church is righteous and the leadership is righteous, the nation will be righteous, Lord, and it will be blessed by you. So God, help us to do our part individually, Lord, and as a church family. God, all those that's listening across the globe, Lord, God, to pray for America. Lord, we pray for other countries today, Lord, because, Lord, there's a lot of countries that want the very same thing that we have, God, but they are under an oppressive regime. God, they're under communism or socialism or just anarchy of some sort. God, we continue to pray for the Ukrainian people, God. Man, what a tragedy that is, Lord. The evil heart of Vladimir Putin and what he's doing. God, bring a stop to that, Lord. People, innocent people, are being slaughtered over there, God. God, judge that, Lord. Bring a stop to it. Bring peace there. Lord, we understand, Lord, the end-time prophecies and that those things are come to come to pass. But, Lord, it doesn't stop us from praying for them, Lord. Have mercy, God. Have mercy today, Jesus. Now, Lord, I pray for those under the sound of my voice, Lord. If their heart is just half-hearted, Lord, they're not really committed to you, Lord, today I pray, God, that my words have convicted them, Lord, that they want to do as I have done, Lord, and say, God, help me to be a man, woman, sold out for you, Lord, 100%, all in, God. And if they're not that, God, may they commit their life to you today. If you're here this morning, I'm going to ask you to bow your head, and you're not a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ. And you would like to commit your life to Christ today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Why don't you choose to follow the Lord today? Can I just tell you something? It will be the greatest decision you will ever make. I have never met a follower of Jesus Christ that said, I wish I'd have never given my life to Christ. I've never met that person. Every person that I know has had a relationship with Jesus, they say it's the greatest thing I ever did. So if you're here and you're not a believer, if you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, I would like a commitment to give my life to Jesus Christ today. I want him to come into my heart and to change me. I'd just like to pray for you as I close in prayer. Anyone at all. I'm not a Christian, but I would like to, to be a follower of Christ today. Everybody's good. All right. Father, I pray for those, Lord, that's listening online. Lord, I, I know 
I'm preaching to the choir today. Most people in here, maybe all, are followers of you. But, Lord, those that may not know you today, Lord, may they just make that commitment to you now and give their heart to you, Jesus. Come into their heart and live, God, and guide. You said if any man will open the door, I stand and knock, and I will come in and sup with him, Lord. So, Father, I pray as they pray that prayer, God, you just come and meet with them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lead us to the throne there, Hunter. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from all my enemies
Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Did we get a breakthrough here? Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. I love that song, don't you? Yeah. Come on. God has set us free from our freedom, uh, from our fears, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, praise God. Lord, it has been so good to be in your house today, God, and to just come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, to love on each other. Lord, I thank you for this lady, Lord, who's come this morning, Lord, who committed her life to you, God. Just bless her, Lord. Brand new child into the kingdom. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Walk with her in the days to come, Lord. Reveal yourself to her, God, in mighty and powerful ways, we pray in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, as we leave this place today, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would go with us in power, God. Lord, I pray that every person, Lord, would be endued with that power to be witnesses unto you, Lord God. Father, we need the power of the Spirit more than ever before, Lord. God, we are faced in a battle, Lord, that we've never seen in America, Lord. God, you told us that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities, Lord powers, spiritual rulers of the darkness of this world, Lord, spiritual wickedness in high places. But God, we know that the Holy Spirit of God is greater than all of those things, Lord. And as we walk out of this place, God, I pray your spirit walks out in power with us, oh Lord. Help us through every part of every day of this week, Lord. I pray, God, a refreshing on the body of Christ today, Lord. And God, I pray that you would just give us boldness, Lord, to be witnesses for you, God. When we have an opportunity to witness, Lord, help us to step out with courage, Lord, and to speak forth the name of Jesus with love and compassion, discernment. God, I pray that you give us the words to say, Lord. You told the disciples, I will give you the very words to say in the hour you're to say them. God, you can do that in each and every one of our lives, Lord, if we'll just be obedient to you. So, Father, I pray that you just reveal yourself, God. Father, I pray for the most timid person in this room. God, as they step out in faith, Lord, that you just, Lord, reveal your power in them, Lord. And they just see you perform, God, as they just step out in faith and obedience to you, Lord. God, I just ask that you do this. Lord, I'm expecting testimony next week of somebody that just stepped out in faith and shared their faith. And, God, they saw you work mightily in their life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, as we go to our homes, Father, I pray a blessing over the body of Christ, over every home that is represented, God. God, make it a refuge, Lord, an escape from the world, Lord, a place where you are welcome. God, strengthen the family, husbands and their wives, Lord. Lord, that they fall in love with each other again. Lord, they start courting each other again. Parents and their children, Lord siblings one with each other. Now, Lord, there are some young men, young ladies that I know personally, God, and they're, they're alone, Lord, and they want to find that special person. Lord, I've seen you answer this prayer already a couple times. Lord, I pray that you answer it in every, every situation, Lord. They find that special person, Lord. Lord, we pray for a baby this morning. God, we prayed for that baby's mate that's being raised somewhere. God, somewhere out there is that person, Lord, that you have a plan, Lord. That couple, God, when you put them together, there is a mission for their life as a couple. And, God, they're looking for that person. God, I pray that you help their paths to cross, Lord, and they find each other. And then, Lord, if there's somebody and they're just content to be alone, Lord, and they just want to serve you, Lord, then you be their helper and you be their mate. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, church. Jesus, I am. Only way to truth, the gospel is free.